back in the early 70s, I saw something that I will never be able to fully understand and will certainly never forget. I was just a teen at the time, and even now, I can still vividly see him. Growing up on the Jersey Shore, we spent a lot of our time on the beaches and in the water. There would be an occasional shark sighting now and again, and the beaches would be closed off. But it never lasted for long, and certainly, on the stretch of beach we frequented, there weren't any actual attacks. Of course, that didn't mean that the sharks weren't out there, or that they weren't killing other things in the ocean. And sometimes, we'd run down to the shore after school let out, and find all sorts of half-eaten creatures that had washed up after Sharky had finished with their snack. Being teens, we were more morbidly fascinated rather than grossed out by it. It was often more a case of what was the sickest looking thing we could find. And I'm pretty sure the octopus that washed up with each of its tentacles bitten off halfway was one of the closest times I came to losing my lunch. But despite all of this, we never actually ever saw a shark. I wish we had, because what we did see one day, back in the early 70s, was way more frightening than any great white shark. And to this day, I have no idea exactly what it was. It was the end of summer, and it was evening time. Now, you may well have gotten an image in your head of the boardwalk, and the places in Jersey which are heaving with tourists, and I apologize if I was misleading, as this particular area I'm referring to, where we used to hang out, wasn't so much private, but it was a bit more off the beaten track, so only locals tended to visit, which was fine by us, as oftentimes it was just there. Anyway, so, it was late summer, late evening, but not yet night, so it was getting dark, but we could still see okay. And what we saw, I'm just going to come out and say it. We saw a gator man, or as I describe it later on, because we're not the only people to see this thing, a humanoid alligator. I was real grateful. I had some buddies with me at the time. Not just because it scared the crap out of me, but so I could prove I wasn't lying or hallucinating or something. After all, it was the 70s, so I'm pretty sure a lot of people were still using acid or smoking weed. But to be clear, we were not. In fact, we were all sober, and had been. Hell, my dad was a cop. He'd have beaten me black and blue if I ever did a drug. So, there were four of us, all completely sober, and we all saw this gator man. The best way I can describe him is he looked like a real tall alligator. Like, instead of having those tiny squat little limbs, so it looks like they're wandering about on their belly, it had arms and legs, the size and length of a person but still covered in scales with claws, and a full of gator head with that long snout and huge teeth. It had reared up out of nowhere, in the ocean, but close enough for us to be able to see it. I think the water came up to like where its knees would have been. I have no idea what it did then, or where it went off to, because you can bet your bottom dollar that we ran out of there as fast as we possibly could and did not look back. There were quite a few sightings of him that summer, enough for us to believe that it wasn't some sort of hallucination. But then he disappeared. What he was, why he was there, I'll never know, but I'll never forget him. When I was in college, I took a road trip with my roommate back to her home in Ohio for Thanksgiving. It was a long drive, to say the least, but the promise of a week of home cooking 
and free laundry was more than enough to make the journey worth it. My roommate was a lot of fun and came from a huge family, most of which I'd be meeting over the next few days. So, the trip went by fairly quickly as she joyously told me the various stories featuring Uncle Lenny or her cousin Susie. We made sure to take plenty of rest stops and even had lunch at a mom and pop's roadside diner. We texted her mom whenever we had bars or service to let her know our progress. Things were going great. Then, we came to this strip of highway that looked like it hadn't been used in decades. It was like something straight out of a serial killer movie, and we laughed and joked about finding a broken down car on the side of the road. A Bundy-esque dude just waiting to club us over the head. Of course, since I'm writing into you to tell you this story, you know that didn't happen. Also, you talk about cryptid monsters and not humans. Anyway, whilst we were laughing and planning on how we would escape and be final girls, we did see something on the side of the road. But it was Bundy or BTK, obviously. This thing seemed much smaller than a person to start with. And as we got closer, at first, we presumed to be it was some kind of dog. I don't know why, to be honest, because even as we were approaching it, I could tell that it appeared to be a greenish color, and dogs don't tend to be that sort of shade. It also appears to stand up, because we could see legs. So, and we still are a little bit away. It looks like we are approaching something smallish, maybe around four feet tall, standing upright on two legs, and green. I can very distinctly remember that as we drove past it, as we were literally eye to eye looking at it out of the passenger window. Neither of us said a word. We were both completely silent for a good five to 10 minutes afterwards. My roomie did not slow down at all, but she didn't speed up either. We just kept rolling. Finally, I do remember folding my hands onto my lap and staring straight ahead out the windshield. Not looking at my buddy, I simply said, did you just see that really tall frog standing up like a person? She then burst out in what seemed like a relieved laughter and exclaimed yes. We both had a nervous laugh for a bit. And to be honest, I'm not too sure that either of us could fully quite comprehend exactly what we had just driven past. I mean, it's not exactly an everyday occurrence to see Mr. Toad from Wind in the Willows stood by the side of the road, is it? Of course, this guy wasn't dressed in clothes that would be ridiculous. But he was like the size of a human child, and he was most definitely upright, on two bowed legs, not crouched down, ready to jump on all four, like a regular frog would. It honestly went through my mind that maybe we had been poisoned or drugged by the coffee at the diner, because it couldn't possibly be real. But if we were, then we showed no other signs or symptoms. So what the hell did we see? Is there really a species of tall two-legged frogs roaming the highways out here in Ohio? Was he trying to hitchhike? We'll never know. But we still often think about that frog man and what he is up to these days. I mean, after all, I think there was a pretty large swamp or marshland nearby. Either way, we try to make jokes about it, but it's still freaky because we both saw the exact same thing. I work in the mailroom for a huge corporate business. The hours are long, tedious and repetitive, but the paycheck is good and the company I am down there, even better. To keep ourselves from going mad, we often tell each other stories. Since we're all over 18, we will often try and freak each other out. 
despite the business being worth millions. The mailroom is still a bit of a throwback, and although our working area is fine, and the break room and bathrooms are clean, there are still a few old, dark, and dingy storage areas down there. I see myself as a bit of a master storyteller, and had been busy memorizing a much long creepypasta as I could find to keep the mantle of King of Creepy going as I possibly could. Urban legends, crappy remakes and sequels to movies that no one had ever watched, so they didn't know how the plotline went. I loved it. As soon as my shift started, I had people begging me to tell them more and more spooky stuff. So, in a way, it was typical that what happened down in one of those dark, damp and dingy storerooms happened to me, as literally no one believed me. They all thought it was just another one of my stories, or that I was setting them up for a prank. But I wasn't. As I have already mentioned, the actual warehouse part where we spent most of our time, and the parts of the building that we used for breaks, was absolutely fine and had been fitted out with damp proofing, AC in the summer, heaters in the winter. But, shut away down various old corridors was the oldest part of the building, where you only went once in a blue moon if you needed something specific. And it just so happened that a fuse had blown in the plug for the microwave, and, me being me, volunteered to head down to one of the rooms designated as a random storage, as I was sure that I had seen a box of batteries and other stuff down there. It had been raining non-stop for the last week or so, and it smelled even damper than usual the further I headed. There was obviously electricity down there, and lighting, just no heat, so it always smelled kind of rusty and a thick must. The walls even felt damp sometimes. The closer I got to the room, I thought that I could hear a sort of snuffling noise. I'm sure by now you figured I probably don't scare easy, but I still didn't want to come face to face with a rat, since they carry all sorts of nasty diseases. So, although not scared, I had my guard up, just in case. I did have my favorite work boots on, and I was a mean kicker especially during school football. The noise got louder as I approached the door of the storeroom. It almost sounded wet, like something swallowing. It's really hard to describe. I threw open the door, my leg out in front of me, ready to kick or stomp on something. I don't know. It just felt like I needed to be ready for something. I pulled on the cord for the light, and the moment the room was illuminated, I saw it. And I will tell you exactly what I saw the best that I can. It was big. Not as big as me. But then, I'm only 6'4", and not many people are. But I figured it was easily over 5 feet. Whatever this was, was standing upright, on two legs just like you or me. It had very tiny arms that it held in front of itself. Not long, except it was at the side. It was very dark green, grainy looking, and scaly. I can 100% say that it looked lizard-like, because it had a very lizard head and face. It had a very long lizard mouth, and even a nose that looked very lizardy big, bugged-out yellow eyes on either side of its huge face. It looked freaky, but not necessarily fierce. This thing stood about 15 feet away from me, and was a small man-sized two-footed lizard. I was convinced I was looking at some sort of alien, some sort of lizard alien. It looked at me, and I looked at him, or her, or it. It was androgynous. I'm saying him, I have no damn idea what sex it was. I slowly backed out and slammed the door. I ran back to the mailroom and told the others what I'd seen. I was met with an eruption of laughter. 
clapped him on my back, and offered high fives. A couple of them said they believed me, and came back down to the room to see for themselves. But of course, nothing. So it went down as a great prank. Another super story. Only I know what I saw. How it got down there, I have no idea. I know there are old windows on the far side of that storage room that could easily fit a large person through. But those haven't been messed with in a long time. And there are thick forests and woods surrounding the outside of this unit. Who knows? Do I really believe this thing came through the window and was stalking and waiting for the right time in that room? Not really. But I can't think of another reason why this thing was there. My granddad was a sailor, and he used to tell us all sorts of crazy stuff that he saw in the sea. In fact, a lot of the time, he would have a twinkle in his eye and the ghost of a smile as he told us, like the time he supposedly met Blackbeard the pirate, or discovered an underwater city of gold. But there was one story that no matter how many times he retold it, I never saw that twinkle, and that makes me think of the stuff he used to make up to entertain us. This particular tale was true to my belief. They were somewhere near the Caribbean when it happened. Now, before anybody jumps to conclusions, my grandfather has now been dead for at least 20 years. I heard this story when I was around 10, so that's 30 years ago and it happened when he was younger than I am now. So he was not inspired by or retelling of a famous movie featuring Jack Sparrow. He and the crew had been aboard the ship for around a week or so, and everything was going well. They were well on track for whatever their end destination was, and in good spirits. Most of the men at the time were below deck, doing what sailors do. That's when a large splash was heard. A very large splash. Not remotely unusual when you're in the middle of the ocean, of course. But something told him to look out over the side of the ship. At first, he couldn't see what manner of creature was responsible for the sound, but he could see ripples in the water below. He seemed to recall it was around dusk, so although the blazing sun wasn't high in the sky, it was by no means completely dark yet. He also wasn't in the slightest bit frightened, merely curious, as if it were somehow playing with him. The creature refused to come back up to the surface whilst he was watching. He could see bubbles, so he knew something was down there. A lot of the sea life he had encountered were quite nosy, and he'd seen many dolphins, and even an octopus come right up to the ship, as if to say, what are you doing in my ocean? Knowing these things can be playful, he stepped back from the side of the ship, so his sightline of the water was obscured. And sure enough, as soon as he had moved back, he heard two loud splashes again, and a bang, and something bumped up against the bottom of the ship. Still not thinking it was anything that would be a potential threat, he raced back over to try and catch a glimpse. And he was rewarded by catching sight of the very end of a vibrant aqua green tail fin diving back under the water. He remembers thinking that it was the most beautiful color. And also, what on earth must be the fish that the tail fin was on. By now, his curiosity had peaked, but was still not afraid. Backing away slowly, he made sure he was out of sight. But this time, he crept quietly to the edge of the ship so that it could pop up instantly and see what was down there. Maybe he discovered a new breed of fish. As I said, he was curious and now excited to see exactly what was playing hide-and-seek with him. He heard a bump and a splash, and this time, 
shot up as quick as he could to look over the side. As I have said, whenever Granddad told us about meeting Long Zhong Silver or surviving a battle with a Kraken, we knew he was full of it, embellishing things to entertain us. He'd get really animated as he told us, and it often ended up with him making us jump and then smothering us in kisses. But I swear, when he told us this, there was none of that. If you can believe it, he actually paled, and there was a slight tremor to his voice. That was because this time, when he looked over, he did catch a fleeting glance of what was playing with him. It was a mermaid. Don't be fooled for one second that this thing had anything in common with Ariel. The best way that he was able to describe its body was that it looked like Nosferatu with long hair, a gnarled bony body, and a fin. Can you even imagine that? Nosferatu's twisted features with huge warped fangs, wide gaping eyes, but instead of a bald head, long straggly wet hair covered and thick in seaweed. Then, instead of a human body, the rancid, almost concave bony structure with visible ribs and two shriveled, wrinkled chest bones. The only thing to indicate properly that it was indeed a creature of another world. The only thing similar to the Disney film was her fin, which was indeed quite beautiful, and the scale shimmered in the setting sun. Of course, as soon as the creature realized it had been seen, it dove back under the water and never resurfaced. Granddad said, of course, they all knew the legends of sirens who were meant to be beautiful enchantresses who lured sailors with their beauty and song and then usually killed them and ate them. If that had been a siren, then it must have taken a very drunk or desperate man to succumb. Whatever it was, it absolutely terrified my father and my granddad. He never saw anything like it again. But a year or so after that, he stopped sailing permanently and swore to always stay on land from then on out. Thanks for hearing my story. My determination to never own a car is what ultimately led up to the building blocks of this very story. I can't afford to completely live off the grid, but I do everything I can to distance myself from life of dependence. You know, I don't use money unless I have to. I won't be caught dead using a bank. I earn only as much money as I'll have to use. Everything else I try to accomplish with my own two hands. The system wants to shackle these hands. Your hands too. I think it's because of the determination to resist that I ended up having this encounter in the first place. Some of the money that I can't do without is my bus fare. I will not own a vehicle. So, I need to get to where I'm going with the buses that are always crawling all over Manhattan. It's not a bad way to do things. It beats being tied down to a payment and repairs and maintenance costs. Gosh, and freaking insurance. So, when you're taking the bus as often as I, you get to know the patterns of the faces of the people that you see. You get a feel for who works in the morning, or who has errands to run in the afternoon, or who the night workers are. Just for the hay of it, I began taking different buses, just to see the different crowds. It took me several runs to see it, but I began to catch on to that no matter which bus I was on. There was always one person that always was there with me. He was an old man that looked like an old woman if you didn't look close enough. He looked a little on the homeless side, a little on the mentally ill side. He looked a little on every side. A virtual human kaleidoscope with an oversized cowboy hat that's been crushed more than once. A Hawaiian shirt 
that was usually unbuttoned, and pink shorts and sneakers. He was always carrying some variation of paper or plastic shopping bags. He never smiled and never really made eye contact with anyone. You'd think somebody that loud would stand out right away. But I can't describe the way he always kind of blended in with everything. I mean, he was so out there. He was ordinary. Anyway, no matter which bus I took, there was at some point a crazy idea beginning to form in the back of my head that would not be ignored. I got the notion that he was following me. So, I was going to follow him back. The first few times I tailed him, I really didn't think he was aware of me, but I've been doing things long enough to know the revelation comes with persistence. He would stay on the bus for several cycles to the route, as if it were a means of sightseeing. But then, he would get off at a stop and sit down and wait for another bus. Then, he'd ride that one through its route several times. I don't think I ever observed him stopping to use the bathroom anywhere. He just kept going. My bladder and bowels would always seem to scream before his did. Things came to a head that day, and I had finally given up and decided that he was just a derelict old man that had nothing better to do with his twilight years than surf the mass transit system the way most people of later generations surf the internet. Well, then he got off of the downtown junction, where all the routes converged at once. He got off the bus, waited for another one, got on. I kid you not, no more than 10 minutes later, a completely different bus arrived and the same guy got off, waited, got on. Either those buses did some serious moving in 10 minutes, or something else was up. I did some acid back in my younger days, and I started to wonder if those permanent tendencies towards flashbacks were a culprit. But the notion started to gel in my head that there was one of him on every single bus at any given time. The more I shadowed him, the more I watched how often the buses would trade him at the junction that became the only viable explanation. I started going to ridiculous lengths, working longer hours so I could have more money to buy those little micro cams that are so cheap nowadays. I could collect footage from different buses. I know that sounds crazy, but the way we're kept asleep and oblivious to all this stuff is even crazier. Catching on to this was just part of the way I was becoming awakened. Sure enough, he was everywhere. Nobody else was everywhere, just him. He never met himself. His movements were perfectly coordinated so that two of him would never be seen in the same place at the same time. I couldn't think of any purpose this arrangement would serve until it hit me while I was relocating one of my cameras. Surveillance. He they were somebody's eyes and ears it would be too obvious if it were the bus driver put it up to somebody that is so ordinary and so quiet that nobody gives them a second look i felt woke in that moment i felt empowered i had all the footage i needed to make my case and put together like a documentary all i needed was something involving a confrontation candid footage of me calling him out without giving him a chance to rehearse. I made my move at one of the times that he was at the downtown junction very early on in the morning when he was really the only person there. I came on strong, like I might know even more than I was letting on. His eyes roamed me up and down, like some sort of mechanical scan. I became aware of a hissing sound that coincided with his breathing. He looked me in the eyes, but then somehow looked into me. I felt invaded, like he could see me without my clothes on. My vision tunneled, and he was at the focus of it all. Then, 
his lips moved and made some series of syllables that I couldn't derive words from. Green scales appeared on his skin, as if they had been retracted inside of his pores or something. A long tongue even darted out between his lips and wagged at me, and he made the first facial expression I had ever seen on him. A sinister grin, revealing multiple pointed jagged teeth. Then, I felt like I was hit in the face with a sledgehammer. I woke up, underneath one of the small trees surrounding the downtown junction. I didn't know how long I was out, but it felt late. I wasn't missing anything. I had one of the cams in the breast pocket of my hoodie when he turned snake-like in front of me. I thought I was going to strike a big one in the name of Woke. But when I got my cams and stuff home, they had been wiped. All footage I'd ever taken just showed white noise. What's more, all of his copies disappeared, and I never saw him or anyone like him again. I have heard about snake people being in the upper areas of business and government, but I got a serious chill thinking about what they would want by taking their game all the way down to the bottom watching over ordinary people like me that blow in and out of the wind like litter. Are they keeping tabs on all of us that closely? And what kind of voodoo was it that knocked me out? A spoken word cut my lights out. Maybe that's how they work. Maybe that's part of how they hide in the broad daylight. They don't just blend in. They got some kind of voodoo magic going on. I don't know like some sort of supernatural power. Look out if you keep seeing someone familiar on public transportation. They might just be a sleeper cell, waiting, listening, watching. I remember in fifth grade, we got a substitute teacher that stayed much longer than any sub should have. She was large and loud, and the only part of her that wasn't ridiculously big was her feet. Her thighs were like freak of nature beets that had slender roots for her to walk on. We kept asking her when Mrs. Wimmer was gonna come back. She would just tell us soon enough, but we lost track of how long our real teacher was absent. It had to have been weeks. One day, she told us that we're going to watch a film so amazing that we would watch it for the duration of the day, breaking only for lunch and recess. I had no idea what kind of film would run for so long. Just before she started up the film, I had to get up and use the bathroom. I should have asked for permission, but it hit me so hard that I couldn't risk a no. When I got back, the television rack was already in front of the class, and white static filled the screen. Those of you old enough to remember those days know that meant the video was starting soon. But the video never started. I stared, patiently waiting for the black leader of the first few inches of film to be read. It never did. While I was waiting, everyone in the classroom burst out into laughter. It died down. It was as if something funny had happened on the TV. It happened again. I looked into the static with confusion. There was nothing there. No sound, nothing. It was one of those screens that were rounded. Such were the old makes. In a corner, I saw a reflection of the lamp at the teacher's desk, and the teacher's face lit up by it. And the reflection distorted all kinds of ways was something that made me catch my breath once I worked it out. Something just as scaly and hideous as a crocodile was sitting at that desk. I whirled around to see the very human teacher sitting behind the desk, but she was looking straight at me, and the eyes I saw then were the same eyes I saw in the corner of the TV screen reflection there was more laughter around me from everybody, and the teacher smiled, a very evil, sinister smile. 
I feigned illness for as long as possible until my act fell apart. By then, weeks later, there wasn't a classroom to go back to. One of my classmates went on to do extremely violent acts. His excuse was that the teacher had taught him both through lessons and through videos that it was the right thing to do. As far as I know, that substitute teacher was never known of. I've used Google and white pages and all else using what little information about her I could find. It's like tracking down a ghost or a chameleon that disappears into the background. Either way, seeing that crocodile of a person left me terrified and I have no idea if she came from this earth or another planet or the pits of hell itself. All I know is that it, assuming that's what it was, disguised itself as a person because its intentions were not the same. When you live out in the countryside, you get the pleasure of hearing all sorts of wild tales. Many of them, you can just chalk up to folks being bored and having crazy imaginations. Overblown hunting stories, all sorts of critters and animals spotted on the hillside. If you live anywhere out in the country or outside the city, you probably have your own experiences or memories of being told stories. Some of them sound like the person retelling of their own stories of the old and have probably sunk a little too much moonshine over the years. And then, there are those which sound so damn unbelievable and stupid, you know they have to be fake. That is, until the day you witness it for yourself. That's what happened to me. I had lived and worked on our farm all my life. My great-grandparents built it from nothing, from the ground up with their two hands. It was the pride and joy of the family. Not too far from our furthest field was a larger river. And even though this was farm country, this particular river in parts was more swampy, really deep and boggy, and we made damn sure to keep fencing up so none of the livestock ended up falling and drowning. Of course, this also made that particular area of water something of a local Area 51 for the crazies to come up with their conspiracy theories. You see, they had reported all sorts of weird noises and sounds, and especially lights at night, but I had never seen or heard any of that myself, even though many of them claimed that there were weird things going on. One of them claimed there was a weird magnetic sensation around that river. But again, I never experienced that, nor would my family ever admit to such things. One in particular, though, made very little sense. It was the usual power company that pumps chemicals into water, causing babies to be born with six toes kind of BS, which I never believed a word of, until one day. My little brother came running back to the barn, saying he'd seen a frog in the river as big as one of the farm cats. Listen, I still didn't think for one second that he could be right, but it did get me thinking. I wandered down there a bit later, and whilst I didn't see anything particularly suspicious then, there did seem to be some issues that warranted further investigation, such as a large flattened area that looked like some sort of animal had made itself a nest there. But really, what is big enough and wanted to live in the dank conditions? Well, I had no idea. Farming life is busy work, and I soon forgot about going back down there. Cleanly went out of my mind, truth be told. That is, until we began losing sheep. Now. Every farmer knows the odd attack on animals is not unheard of, and sometimes a fox, bobcat, cougar, or whatever will get onto your property and maul something for its dinner. We had three of our sheep go missing in as many days. No sign of any broken fencing, and the only real clue was a large puddle to where near they'd been snatched in a terrible smell, kind of like a swampy bog in the river. It had a very interesting, unique odor profile. It was extremely musky, 
If you've ever smelt a skunk, you'll know that a skunk is overly musty. Well, it was kind of like that, but its own unique musty odor profile. And the third was taken, and still presuming that this was the work of some kind of wild cat or dog. Although with the smell, I had nothing to pinpoint it to. So, I decided to stay up that night and keep watch, staying far hidden out of sight with my shotgun by my side, of course. Whatever nasty predator was messing with our livelihood wouldn't be making the same mistake again once I had attempted to blow a hole in it, or, if I was lucky, blow its head clean off. I waited and waited, and sometime in the early hours, right before dawn, I had heard it. A loud, squelching, wet-sounding footsteps. For a moment, I couldn't fathom what I was seeing. And to this day, whenever I tell this story, it sounds like something from the sci-fi channel. There, stepping over the fence with ease and heading right for one of my biggest snoozing sheep was what I would describe to you as a lizard man. Yes, you heard me right. A lizard, as tall as a man, standing upright like a man, with two legs, two arms, a body, walking just like you or I. I literally use the term lizard man as accurately as I can. What I was looking at was undoubtedly half man, half lizard, at least in appearance. It hopped over to the sheep, its grayish scaly body seeming to glow in the moonlight. Its face was kind of reminiscent of a gecko, eyes on the side, and a snout and a long forked tongue which shot out occasionally. It picked her up with ease and turned around, so I got a good view of its back, including its long sweeping tail that was more reminiscent of an alligator. At that point, I was so stunned. I suddenly had to give myself a mental shake, and I fired off the gun. Three shots. This thing turned around and let out this horrible scream or roar. It was a really loud hiss, but it sounded distorted. It wasn't right. This thing looked right at me, and then ran, still carrying the sheep. Despite being utterly terrified, I ran after it, following it to the river. I shot off five more rounds, hearing each shot land somewhere in the water. I waited, but I never saw a body rise to the surface. In fact, I wasn't even 100% sure that I hit this thing. I consider myself a decent shot, but this, I'm not sure. Eventually, I went back to the farm, and the next day, I went back down there with some of the guys. We all had guns as we poked and prodded at the river. We fired off of our bullets, but we never found anything. I think I must have heard him that night though, as not once did we lose a sheep again. Even though that happened to me, I still feel really skeptical about the whole aliens thing. But who knows, maybe what I saw was indeed an alien, which would explain all the lights and weird sounds that many people claim to see and hear around there. I'm not exactly sure, and I never would imagine an alien looking like a lizard man. Back in high school, we all had this gym teacher whom we hated. He was tall and thin and looked down, literally and figuratively, on anybody who wasn't any good at sports. This included things as much as running and track, let alone football and any other recreational sport. He was a real show-off, spent far more time in lessons demonstrating just how great he was rather than actually letting us play. Prideful much, and in no lesson was this more the case than swimming. Whether he thought we should have been in the Olympics, or whether he imagined that his lean, muscular body was a turn-on for the senior girls, I don't know, but he always seemed to find a way to end up in the pool showing us all how to execute the perfect dive, or whatever. I suppose that maybe some of the girls might have thought he was handsome. I'm not too sure. But aside from being a job's worth and a slave driver, 
He had these really intense eyes. I used to joke with my buddies in the locker room that the reason he was so strong and agile, and especially good in the water, was because he was a lizard. See, I wasn't good at sports, but I aced creative writing. Years spent devouring comic books gave me a very wicked imagination. I would just spend all this time making up these little stories about him, and of course they loved it, egged me on, laughter filling me. However, it was all in jest, right? A way of dealing with inadequacy and possibly a little bit of envy. And, I mean, the dude scared me. He loved handing out Saturday detentions like it was nothing and I just scored a weekend job in the independent bookstore. No way I was going to mess that gig up. So, when I got called into his office after track one day, I just hoped and prayed to everything there is that none of my buddies had betrayed me. Turned out the course, someone had, and he was pretty pissed about it. I remember him barking at me, and I just remember falling into the chair. He told me that he heard that I like to make up stories, but I could just feel his eyes boring into the back of my head. I asked, not wanting to give myself up, if I had a sliver of chance making it without punishment. I mean, what could he possibly do? He slowly walked over to his desk, facing the wall behind him, and told me one of my boys, my friend Charles actually, said was a snitch and told me all about my locker room games. He asked me if I thought it was funny, with a very stern and serious look, not even joking. I thought this was going to be the end. I would regret not graduating high school. But I just sat there, gripping my chair, in hopes for just a warning. I answered to him, no sir, and I began when all of a sudden he turned around in his chair put his hands on the desk and leaned over so he was really close to me. I thought I was about to get the most intense chewing out of my life. You know, kind of like how when you screw up and your dad pulls you in close and just lets you have it verbally. Well, that's what I thought was going to happen. The suddenness of the move took me by surprise by what happened next. I'd swear my life on it. His face was right in front of mine close enough to feel his hot breath, and he stared very intently into my eyes. One, two, five, ten seconds. He just kept staring and never blinked. Then, he blinked really fast, and just for a split second, his pupils were slits and yellow, like bright sunshine yellow, like a lizard. Then he blinked again, and they were back to his usual green eyes. He smiled and had a huge grin that seemed to stretch openly across his face. I must have just been there, sitting there, mouth agape. He answered yes. I think that'll be all. He looked at me very sternly and told me I won't be making up any more stories, will I? I sat up straight and answered no sir and just about managed to shoot out of the door as quick as I could. I never really told anybody about what I saw, and I sure as hell stopped making up stories about him. I didn't know exactly what he was, but that moment is something I'll never forget. Well, I tried to jump on YouTube and Google and find out what I could, and that led me down the rabbit hole known as not only lizard people, but actually reptilians. Reptilians in disguise and I think he might be one. And here I was, never thinking that lizard people were actually a thing, but turns out reptilians are a real thing, and I did not unmistakably see those slits in his eyes. Was he hiding it? Was he purposefully showing it to me? I don't know. I think it was some sort of intimidation tactic to keep his anonymity. I'm going to get this story out there as much as I can. From now... I believe that these things and people are real. When you're a kid, you do all sorts of dumb stuff, right? The power of truth or dare, and especially 
The terrifying must-do status of the Double Dare was something that you lived by when you were a kid. At least, we did. This was the early 90s, way before the internet and cell phones rotted our brains and took over our entire society like mindless drones you see today. We'd all heard the rumors, urban legends about people buying what they thought were turtles, and when they turned out to be baby gators, they flushed them down the toilet, right? Well, the thing is, a rumor has to start somewhere. On this particular day, it had been raining heavily all morning, and me and my two best buddies had been stuck indoors for hours. Finally, the heavy downpour dissipated enough that we were allowed to play outside. Donning our raincoats, I called out, dare you go look in the storm drain? It must have been the overexcitement of being let out after having been cooped up all morning, as I really hadn't thought it through. I realized this as soon as my buddies replied in unison that they double dared you to. Crap. As a kid, you know, the double dare is holy. There is no backing out. You literally have to do it. So, I did. I walked over to the drains. I could see the water almost overflowing down there. Almost, but not quite. There was just enough of a gap to be able to peer down deep into the dark. Now, Pennywise may have been scaring kids and adults around the same time, but none of us had been allowed to watch it or even know what it was. So, I wasn't worried about clowns or balloons. No. We had heard there were rats as big as cats, and that sometimes you might see a giant turd floating past. That was the extent of our juvenile minds at this point. So when I bent down, my hand covering my mouth and nose, as there was a distinct sulfury stench emanating from below, the last thing I expected to ever see were two reptilian eyes staring at me. I just about peed my pants and fell backwards into a larger puddle on the road, soaking my pants and my butt. Of course, my buddies were close to wetting themselves too, with laughter and not with fear like I was. That was, until those bright yellow eyes rose out of the sewer water, attached to what I can only assume was the head of an alligator or a crocodile. I don't really know the difference. What I do know is that this isn't Florida or the Amazon or something. This was a little suburb outside of New York. The only place I should have been seeing this guy was in a Central Park Zoo. I screamed, not caring what my buddies thought. I screamed and screamed, and for whatever reason, this seemed to frighten or at least startle this creature. And before it could leap out of the drain in what I thought was going to devour me, it was gone. My friends came running over, asking what the matter was. Did I see a rat? Or a giant turd? It was... Uh, I stopped for a moment. I still wasn't sure exactly what I had seen. I told them it was a crocodile. And of course, they laughed at me. They laughed at me the rest of the entire day. They just told me good one, and kept slapping me on the back. But I insisted over and over that I saw something that didn't look right. I don't even know if it was a crocodile. It just looked like one. It didn't act like one. A crocodile wouldn't show that much interest in me, and I'd like to think so, and wouldn't stare at me with intelligence like this thing seemed to do. I don't know. I know there are rumors of alligators and crocodiles living in storm drains, but how much of that is actually truth? I don't know. In fact, I'm still not even sure if they believed me. I don't think I would, had it happened to my friend and they told me. But I'm telling you, I know what I saw, and I think this is more than just seeing an alligator in a storm drain. This was something else entirely. I'm originally writing in from Ireland. I own a bed and breakfast here, and have done so for around 40 years. Our bed and breakfast has been in my family for multiple generations, and I do my work with the utmost pride. 
You can imagine, having it have been in my family for this long, I take great care when it comes to our business. I have hosted guests from all over the world and enjoy hearing many different types of stories. I suppose it's been a quiet career in many respects, but it has had its moments. Well, I shouldn't continue ranting and raving. The reason I am sending this to you is to discuss a happening that occurred right around April of 1995. I remember it well, as it was around Easter time, and that time of year always attracts a horde of surfers. Granted, this was long before Ireland got Americanized, and surfing was a rare sport then, but my guest at the time, his name I'll keep anonymous, but we'll call him Martin, was a surfing instructor and stayed at my bed and breakfast for only a few nights as he was training a group of young guns on the waves. Well, I made Martin a big Irish fish fry and told him to have a great time on the waves. I remember him saying to me with a smile that why don't I come out and watch him? Of course, running the business, some days were kind of dead, and I had no real plans for that day, except doing a bit of washing, and so I told him that I think I would. It's best to try and stay young, I thought, so I have to try new things, and constantly be putting myself out there. I had no intention of going surfing, of course. I would just watch him, train his crew, and cheer them on. Plus, after working day in, day out, life started to become mundane, and so I need something, a little bit of excitement. I decided to even bring in a flash of tea down for them. Well, something happened out on the water. Something that troubles me to this very day. Something that took this bay away from me. It's a very romantic, sensatious sight, and now it's filled with horror and defilement. Anyway, I was watching Martin and his students from the sand. They were doing great, and I loved watching them on their boards. Some were good, and some were not so good. It was after around an hour that Martin remained in the water himself and his students went back to get changed. He was a very strapping man, and the water appeared to be his domain. It seemed he was very comfortable, and on a surfboard, he was gliding like it was nothing. You could tell he surfed with confidence and experience. My eyes enjoying the sight and savoring the moment of watching an expert teach somebody. Then my blood ran cold, Something came up from behind Martin in the water. From what I can make out, it was an odd, bizarre, and horrific looking sight. It was a creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was no more than the size of a dog. It was a dark scaly green color from what I could see, and it appeared to have six legs or appendages, but I could not see its fins. The legs were like three on each side supported by a long body. It had a very long tail that shot upwards and extended about one foot above its head. Its face, however, was the oddest thing. The only thing I can even compare it to is that it was fleshy, red, and kind of had a beak, like in a way that a squid would. It had a distinctive sagging of its skin. It looked bizarre. I shouted at Martin to get out of the water, all this while happening in just a matter of seconds. I was screaming as loudly as I could. He looked up and waved, but not noticing this thing behind him. The creature then shot out at Martin and seemed to dig its beak deep into his foot. He fell off his board, screaming, thrashing around the water. His foot too was tied on by a rope of a surfboard, so it looked quite heavy as he shook that off. Eventually, he grabbed his board and crashed it down into the water, as if trying to wrestle off this thing. I stood only meters away now, but frozen, eyes wide in complete terror, as I watched man vs. beast unfold before my very eyes. I heard a large groan, and then I saw Martin running, limping, blood dripping down. I was so relieved he had gotten out safely 
whatever that thing was nicked him pretty good. And after getting some medical care, we ended the night with having tea and crumpets and wondered what the hell he saw. The main thing that we could agree on was that he was safe and nobody was really seriously hurt. Naturally, Martin left and I managed to get his wound dressed up, even more so later on that night. I never thought much about the incident afterwards, but this year during lockdown, I got a phone call from none other than Martin. He is in his mid-50s now, and he told me that he came across a database of mythical creatures, or so he told me, and he thinks he found the thing that attacked him all those years ago. I was shocked and found the entire thing unbelievable. Thankfully, I have never heard of anybody else coming across a beast like this, but I thought it was good to write to you and let you know what happened about all those years ago. You know, sometimes I wonder if plastic pollution or even chemical pollutants in the ocean have caused certain marine creatures to deteriorate or even mutate into form. It is logical and a very plausible explanation. I don't believe in sea monsters, but I do believe in chemical mutations. Anyway, I hope that we can identify the creature. I still have his number, and we are both eager to find a resolution, since we both still talk about it, even all these years later. In fact, I figured by writing to you, I could get more answers as to what this potential mutant water reptile could possibly be. But even after doing my own research when I have time, I can't find anything on what the descriptions that I gave you match up with any animal or any living thing currently in the ocean, which can only make it a handful of options, either a mutant or something else. After scouring YouTube about who I can talk to, I came across you and a couple of others, so I wanted to write into you about a very odd experience that occurred in the winter of 2018. Now, it is crucial that I can remain confidential and anonymous, as I am a screen director on a celebrity challenge show. Our show has an international audience and attracts millions of viewers. Basically, we pay celebrities to come onto our show, spend a few weeks in a jungle, and partake in pranks, challenges, and particularly feasts such as eating bugs, skydiving, etc. It has been a fun job and a pleasure to entertain millions of people. But last year, I quit after a very unfortunate incident which occurred the previous winter. We have safety engineers and skilled rescue workers on all of our challenges who ensure no harm come to anybody. Our insurance covers any unusual experiences and we get all the celebrities to sign confidential contracts that explain the risks on the show. However, this particular incident was beyond any risk that I could have envisioned. I hope you can appreciate that I have to try and remain confidential as possible. Basically, one of the challenges involved a particular water task. It required the celebrity to climb down a narrow well and swim through a tunnel filled with water of course, the tunnel was secure, and we had done all the reasonable risk assessments. We had trained divers on standby, just in case anything went wrong. You kind of have to in these situations. You want to make sure your butt is covered. So, this individual went down the tunnel and had the goal of collecting stars throughout the tunnel, which was filled with water. They were fitted with an oxygen tank and got a pep talk. Well... She went down the tunnel, and this person, who I also have to make sure they are nameless. When she went down, she said she felt fine and could give thumbs up if she felt comfortable. The signal for trouble was two fingers raised. So of course, all the crew were quite shocked when she immediately raised three fingers and went down. Initially, we assumed it was a joke, but she started flapping her arms like a darn banshee and we sent one of our divers down. The next thing that happened was unbelievable. We watched it all from our monitors at our station booth. An odd looking thing. 
I say thing because it was some sort of creature. It wasn't an animal. It wasn't a fish. And it wasn't a person. Whatever this was, was rapidly fast and swam faster than anything I had ever seen. And it sunk its teeth into the right arm of this girl. This thing was odd as hell looking. It looked very lizard-like in the face, was blue, had spiky thorns all along its back and head, and its face seemed to have red on it. The body was a mixture of orange and blue, but it almost seemed to blend into the water. As I pressed closer to the monitor, I saw the creature had a tail that was flexible and swayed sideways as it swam along. I screamed to get her out. I yelled to the divers, and I sent all four guys in to get her. This thing now released its grip and was tugging at the wires on her neck, which were directly linked to her oxygen supply. I exclaimed and wiped my brow and looked at this monstrosity again. This time, I remember I tried to study its face, the fact that it had expressions and features. It almost resembled that of a large reptile, like some sort of hybrid the creature released its grip, showing fangs that were about the size of several inches long. It moved with a rapid motion, showing clear intent to wound, or even worse. The creature then locked its grip on one of the divers, this time in his lower abdomen. It looked horrendous. The diver was able to punch off as he thrashed around, banging his head against the tunnel wall. The creature then returned to the celebrity's neck. My face being drenched in sweat, I had the most terrible feeling that somebody was going to die. It continued to grip at the celebrity's neck, and I began seeing splashes of blood pouring out and bubbling. I thank God that this wasn't live on air. We were most definitely going to have a lawsuit, but I didn't know what the hell that thing was in the water. And finally, the divers managed to retrieve her and get this thing off of her. We watched it swim through the tunnels before it finally disappeared. It was by far the most bizarre experience and most of the crew were watching. I have no explanation for how this even happened or where it came from or what this was. Naturally, the first aid crew arrived and gave her the needed medical attention. As it happens, we are also being, or were, also being sued by this same person. She believes we planted this thing there to attract ratings. Even though this segment was never aired, it has found its way onto the dark web. I'm not sure how that happened, but it makes me sick that some people would want to watch somebody else in distress. I have no desire to relive the incident, as I even recounting it makes me feel worse and I could feel the nerves and anxiety running throughout. I'm typing this up to you before I have to deal with this lawsuit, and if anybody has ever seen this creature before, or anything similar, I would like to know that I'm not the only one who's crazy. The show and company that I was a part of were also heavily crucified morally and socially. In fact, we even had a sect of the police come out and deal with this investigation, as they called it. Many of our stuff was taken. Cameras, footage. Much of almost everything was taken. And in fact, this isn't the American police, by the way. This is a sect of police that I believe derived from the UN, or so I was told. But again, this was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Even though the show is set and based in Asia, I know that there are all sorts of wild and unusual creatures there, but not unlike anything I've ever seen before. I still feel dread and fear over the entire thing. Not just what could have happened, or seeing this unknown thing, but the fact that I'm now dealing with a sect of police that are from a global unit, and the potential wrath of any Asian governments that decide to step in. I hope if the lawsuit goes well, that perhaps I can return to having a career again, but we'll see what happens. I don't know if there's any... I don't know if there's any such thing as a giant water reptile, but if there was, this fits the description quite well.
I was on a major roll with a hike in the Arizona wilderness. The sun was beginning to set, and I found myself following a set of railroad tracks into the sort of places you don't really want to be caught alone in. You know well what I'm talking about. The desert itself is not a place you want to be, and Arizona proves to be a death zone if caught off guard. But I was too pumped, too flushed with endorphins, too ready to go and make the feeling last. I could see the red cliffs that had loomed over me all day, turning a rich pink in the setting sun. The clouds soon followed suit. I promised myself that I would be turning around and heading back to town at a reasonable hour before wolves or coyotes or anything else would be afoot when I was heading back. The things you have to do to stay safe. The tracks led me right into a ghost town. No kidding. Some no-name one-horse settlement in the middle of nowhere where the railway happened to pass through. You might find many places like this among Nevada and Arizona. Old homesteads, houses, even towns that were once a place of booming business and life, and now just a decrepit old shack. This place was so old that everything was thin and hollow, enough to be cardboard props for a Hollywood movie set, I guess. But it did have all the earmarks of authenticity. I tried to pull up my GPS just so I can get an idea of what this place is and what it might have been at one point in time but I had no signal. And if you're trying to get your GPS going and you have no signal, well, you know how difficult that can be. I glanced around for even the slightest footprints and there were none. Not that I really expected any to be preserved with the level of wind traffic, but you know, I was hoping I could have gotten lucky. There was something off about the place, other than the simple fact that it was uninhabited the buildings were ordinary enough, looked like they belonged, but there was something else that I couldn't quite put my finger on, and I wasn't quite sure what it could have been. Small as it was, it wasn't just a camp either. And there were the remains of a post office, a very small saloon, several dwellings and businesses that I couldn't even associate without a profession. It was when the shadows were their longest before there weren't any light left to cast that I realized what seemed off about the place. The layout was the usual, north, south, east, west that you usually saw. It was all laid out in a way, suggesting that there was at one point, something, at the very center of town. It gave the entire place a very similar atmosphere. Stonehenge, maybe? No. Not that I'd ever been there before, but darkness was coming quickly so I decided to scope out the center of town and find out what the literal center of the attention was all about. Maybe snap a few pictures and get out before the local wildlife would give me anything to worry about. I don't know about you, but I really don't want to be caught in a pack of coyotes, especially if they're hungry and they're looking for a meal. Or, God forbid, whatever else roams the desert at night. I've heard stories of skinwalkers and while I don't believe them, I don't want to be caught by them, assuming they're true. I discovered that the focus of town was a wooden obelisk, eaten with time, just like the rest of everything in town, and yet it was also somehow more intact than everything else around it. It also seemed like it was the oldest thing. I was nearly scared half to death as a voice greeted me out of nowhere. It appeared to be a young woman, and she wanted to know if I was lost. I was going to remark at how I didn't think there was anybody else around here in this abandoned place, when I suddenly saw movement all around me. Mostly silhouettes and vague shapes among the husks of abandoned buildings and what was left. The most disturbing glimpses were from the young woman herself, though they were fleeting. I swear, I saw the shadow of a tail behind her, like a glitch in reality that lasted nearly a split second. I also saw her tongue flick for a brief moment, narrow and thin like the ribbon of a bookmark. And then, there were those eyes of hers, 
They were an eerie shade of green that seemed to glow. Each passing second brought a nameless tension that caused every hair on my body to stand on end. And the source of it seemed to be divided between her and the wooden obelisk. My mind was screaming magic. I was experiencing some kind of curse or hex, and my most basic instincts knew it. I left without another word, even as the young woman was offering to find a place to put me up for the night. She could call someone to make arrangements to take me wherever I needed to go in the morning. I kept right on trucking until I was far out of there and out in the wilderness following the tracks back home. It was already eerie enough that that place was a dilapidated mess of forgotten memories, but another that this girl, perfectly dressed and didn't look like she was some sort of ruffian, came out of nowhere, offering me a place to stay. I was out of immediate danger, or so I thought, but my story doesn't stop there. I try to tell people about the experience, and nearly every single one of them are dismissive. I couldn't even convince them about the location of this ghost town. My cousin even made a bet with me that if I could drive him to the town, he'd believe me. Sure, no problem. I found the railroad tracks. I picked out the landmarks I could remember, and there was no trace of this town. It was gone. I wondered if I was under some sort of spell of illusion so that I wouldn't see it but I couldn't find the slightest indication of any dwelling in that wilderness. That was the closest I'd ever came to believing all that stuff that I've heard on those 4 a.m. talk shows, you know, about demonic reptile people. To think, they could be living in the dark corners of the earth, like that, right next to us, masking their dwellings with magic, or voodoo, or whatever. I have also considered the possibility that I have had some sort of heat stroke that day. But I find it really hard to believe that I hallucinated a fear that vivid. If supposed reptilians are real, and if the magic they practice is real, then the pecking order that places us in a very, very uncomfortable to ponder. I had the rare privilege of excavating a fossil from some sedimented rock with my uncle. He had been on the dig 14 days prior, and one discovery led to another. A number of finds were the first fully intact specimens ever recorded, and he could not contain his joy, and had to get me involved. He first made me swear to secrecy before he got me involved in the dig. I didn't have any problem with this, but I did wonder why I had to be so hush-hush about something that carried enough raw power that could rewrite everything we knew about the fossil record and some of the things it told us about the history of the world. He understood my basic confusion, but he wouldn't lessen the terms of our agreement at all, nor would he explain anything. He told me that my confidence was more critical than anything else in my life and that whatever he or his superiors told me to do, it was imperative that I obey. So. I agreed. The very first specimen I got to help on Earth was exactly the sort of thing that I wasn't allowed to blab about. Well, oops, I'm blabbing to you. Not just because of what we found, but also because of how it was handled and the implications that it carries. I was expecting the emerging bones to be that of an early human, but the more of the anatomy that was revealed the more it was clearly something else. But it wasn't unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was humanoid, but had a distinct reptilian cast to it. The skull was clearly lizard, very advanced and developed. You can imagine my outrage when the specimen was unearthed and disposed of on the spot with a chipper. My uncle literally put his hand over my mouth and raised a finger to his lips. His eyes darted to his superiors and back to me. It took me a second to connect the dots, but he was dropping me a massive hint. The people overlooking the dig were different. Their gait, their stare, 
The cadence in the way they spoke was stilted, as if they were imposters in their own skin, and doing a very bad job of impersonating themselves. I kept thinking I heard a suppressed hissing sound in their breathing. Whenever I had to talk to any of them, they never smiled. They looked through me, not at me. I felt more and more uncomfortable during the dig, as my brain just simmered on the implications. We had just found a fully intact specimen of a reptilian humanoid. Exactly the kind of internet nut jobs like to defend themselves with tinfoil hats and crystals. The value of that thing in terms of dollars and information would have been astronomical. And just like that, it was destroyed. No questions asked. No harm, no foul. The people that destroyed it were acting like they had to pretend to be normal. They had that cold reptilian stare that's talked about all over those conspiracy theory groups. To this day, I wonder if I was helping the reptilians burn the evidence of their history on our world. I wondered why even my uncle was helping them. That was the beginning of the end of my friendship with him. Maybe he was along just because it was the only thing, or the only way, he would ever get to see any of these discoveries. If I had been anywhere else, I would have missed out and never known what was found. I mean, looking back, I guess I can't hold it against him if he was afraid of what would happen to him if he spoke out. I don't know. The whole thing is huge if my paranoia is right, and I hope it's the kind of story you can use. But to give you a better idea, I don't know the exact country, but somewhere in South America, there's an actual statue. I believe it's made out of gold or some prized material, but it's a statue of a reptilian humanoid creature. If I remember correctly, it's Peruvian or possibly in Brazil. I can't remember what exactly, but the statue depicts a raptor dinosaur looking like humanoid. It's very terrifying, and many scientists believe that old Brazilians used to follow a religion led by a reptilian alien. I don't know how true it is, but that doesn't explain the statue, and it's pretty creepy if you ask me. Now, bring that to modern day, and you pair that with my experience. There's definitely something going on. I spent some time in prison a while back and they sent me to the one maximum security in Nevada that you hear about the least. In fact, most people probably don't even know it exists. I had gotten into a scuffle with another inmate over some gang beef, and the guard that broke things up took an immediate disliking to me. Well, I was riding high after having just broken the other jailbird in two, so I decided I was going to hang on to my big shot status and I spat on the guard's shirt. He looked at my spittle, as if thinking deeply about it. Then he grabbed me and led me away. We were going down a dark hallway that seemed to get longer and darker. I noticed that we were headed someplace that felt isolated and as overcrowded as the place was. That was saying something. I tried to keep up my tough guy routine and I joked about how I must be getting my own personal living space. I can remember the guard didn't even flinch, let alone bust a smile. And I was taken into a room with masonry that was totally off. Like, this wasn't your traditional bricklaying. It was like somebody suddenly decided to build a room in the style of something found in the pyramids. All sorts of weird stuff was carved into the bricks, signs and symbols that I didn't understand, but the collective picture of the whole thing made me very uncomfortable. The guard took off his shirt, and that simple act seemed to make him transform before my eyes. He was now green and scaly, and his skin had a leathery glint. He removed his dark glasses, and there were the two coldest eyes I had ever gazed into. They had a light, an actual physical light to them. They were emitting a glow. And I kid you not, the pupils were slits. The man looked like a snake that decided to be a man. 
He started saying something in a language I didn't recognize, but that didn't keep me from becoming more visibly terrified. More terrified than I had ever been in my entire life. It was like he cast a spell of terror or fear on me. And being a prisoner and an inmate, you get into some pretty life-threatening, serious situations. So I knew terror. But this was totally something else. I was starting to lose my mind, thinking I must be in an episode of X-Files or The Twilight Zone. This must have been a spell of pain, because every slap and punch was electrified. I kept blacking out from the fear, and I'm not that easily phased by physical violence, especially being in an environment like prison. My last few glimpses of the guard included the long blunt claws, pointed and jutting from each finger curled into fists. After that, my eyes were swollen shut from blunt force trauma. That guard was never brought to any sort of justice and nobody, literally nobody, would give my account of what happened any time of the day. If these snake men are running the prisons, what else are they running? What are they really up to? If they knew some sort of voodoo or witchcraft, what does that say about how they're keeping a thumb on the masses? One of them showed themselves to me and beat me to a pulp without a sliver of fear of retaliation or retribution. The unspoken truths hidden in that behavior go beyond personal injustice. And now that I'm out of that hellhole, it is my job to reveal their agenda and their true identities among us. About 15 or so years ago, my family decided to go down to Florida to visit some relatives that we hadn't seen in a really long time. I was probably eight years old at the time, and the last time I saw them, I was only a toddler, so I don't remember them at all. I would even get to play with cousins my age, so I was pretty excited. But as it turns out, I fell ill upon the day of our arrival, after two days of driving. I was quarantined in one of the guest bedrooms at the back of the house, which luckily had a TV, but it was still pretty lame to be unable to go out and play with my cousins. Other than having meals delivered to me, I didn't interact with anybody at all. It wasn't like I had the energy to get out of bed anyway. On the second night of my sickness, I was watching Spongebob, trying my best to breathe as my sinuses were absolutely swollen. It had to be super late for an eight-year-old to be up. I'm pretty sure it was about one in the morning, but I napped a lot during the day. The entire room was dark, except for the TV. I heard something scraping across the wall outside of me. So I turned down the volume and tried to make out what it could be. I glanced over to the window beside me, but I could only see the reflection of the TV and nothing outside. I decided to ignore it, turning the volume back up and continuing to watch TV. A few minutes passed and the noises began again, so I once more turned down the volume and checked the window. I screamed at the top of my lungs when I saw the face of a man looking into the window, except something was very, very wrong. His eyes were massive, probably taking up a fourth of his face, and they were yellow, with cat-like pupils. His face was green and covered in scales, and his mouth had a vague muzzle-like shape. In fact, the entire structure of his face simply got more uncanny the more I stared at him. My aunt came rushing into the room, and I began to cry, telling her about what I saw. She tried to soothe me, and told me that perhaps it was just a fever dream. I swore it wasn't, but she eventually managed to distract me by putting on a movie. Soon enough, I drifted off to sleep, waking up in the morning with the TV still going. I felt a little better that day and wanted to go out, but still was not allowed to. So, I found myself watching TV all day again. My sinuses weren't as clogged as that night, so I managed to fall asleep. However, the sounds of the scraping against the house pulled me out of my slumber, and I opened my eyes to the room 
being completely pitch black. The only hint of light came from the window, and there, I once again spotted this creature staring at me in bed. It flicked out its tongue, which just like a snake was forked before putting its hand on the window, seemingly trying to find a way in. Its hands only vaguely resembled that of a person's. They were longer, more narrow, scaly, dark brown, with thick curved sharp nails, almost like bird talons. I screamed once more, causing my aunt to rush in. Once again, she arrived. I cried about this thing returning, and that I didn't want to sleep in that room anymore. Since the room was used so sparsely, they had never bothered to install blinds or curtains on the window, meaning that this thing could look at me anytime it wanted, and I wasn't having any of it. So, they just gave in and moved me to the living room. At family reunions, people still poke fun at me for this event. I stand by it though. That thing, whatever I saw, was more real than you can imagine. Back in 2004, I was exploring the deep woods just outside of Paris in France. If you've ever got a chance to visit Paris, I highly recommend it. It is beautiful, even if you are not from there and might be an American or Canadian. There's something for you to see. It's just so captivating. It's also the city of love, in case you didn't know. Anyway, I went on exploring into the deep woods around the city because again, there's more to explore than just the city itself. We found many great places to look into, from trails to all sorts of deep woods and locations. There's actually a huge amount of amazing trails all outside of Paris that you can hike. Of course, my French is terrible, and if it wasn't for the friend that I was with, who happens to be from France, but her English is really good, I probably wouldn't even made my way to the bathroom in our hotel. So. A huge thanks goes out to her for getting us around here. But anyway, there is a huge amount of trails to explore, so we just started picking a few and going on them. I don't remember the name of the trail because again, my French is awful, but what I can tell you is that we got by this small lake pond and something terrible happened. At first, I thought there was a crocodile emerging from the water. Whatever this thing was, it was scaly and green, and it was very, very long. Her and I both freaked. The face almost reminded me of that of a shark and had large jagged teeth. The head was almost covered in scales and weird eyes and even had slits on its head. It even had a bony kind of protruding spine with a very skeletal frame. It was wide, but not overly wide and almost seemed webbed and scaly in appearance. This thing was a freak of nature, and it climbed out of the water partially, looked over at us, and kind of had an uh-oh look on its face, like it didn't realize we were there, and slowly crawled itself back under the water, as to conceal itself, like it was trying to get out and be sneaky, but didn't realize we were there. It obviously scared the living crap out of both me and my friend, and we booked it out of there, the whole time I kept talking to my friend, asking, Did you see that? What was that? Her and I kind of just chalked it up to some sort of mutant fish or lizard. I don't know. I have no idea what kind of dump or waste gets poured out here in the waters, but that's what I assumed it was, since I'm not a believer in ghosts or anything weird like that. But this was something I've never seen before. At the time, there was nobody else on this trail. And of course, throughout our time there in France, I had bothered asking some people about that trail and asking if anybody else has seen anything weird, to which of course we got the answer, no, there was not. Which leads me to my ultimate conclusion that we probably just saw some anomaly of nature, some sort of rare mutated creature or lizard. I don't know. I don't know if I'm even submitting this story to the right podcast. It looks like you mostly tell stories that take place at the edge of civilization. Well, my encounter takes place in the heart of it. I was writing the coattails of a very powerful company. 
one that was rapidly rising in the ranks of energy dominance in the Western world. As in reaching up into those tiers where espionage and foul play began to become part of the equation. I wasn't exactly in the club, but I got to wear a suit and with other people who were pretty much gods and neckties. I also got to sit in most of the important meetings, which is where this story really begins. This was a critical year for us, and I was at our HQ in Manhattan, where we had gotten word that we had a prospective partner from overseas that was bringing some very tempting offers. At the time, I thought a partnership would have been pointless, since we were doing just fine on our own, crushing the competition. Taking anybody on as a business partner would be an act of benevolence more than a business strategy. So, the meeting came and went, and everything had to be done through a translator. Long story short, I'll spare you as many boring details as I can. There was a deal struck, and the CEO and owner of their company, who is now the owner of our company, seemed to make eye contact with me, often. I tried to rot it off as nerves or paranoia from stress, but the more I tried to ignore it, the more I could see him looking at me, almost into me. He would be speaking to somebody else at the conference table. Somebody else would be speaking, but his eyes were on me. Before long, I was invited to what was more or less a personal meeting with the new CEO, if you didn't count the interpreter and one or two silent bouncers, essentially gorillas in suits. The new CEO, who we'll call Mr. Moon, greeted me enthusiastically in our first meeting and lavished me with over the acquisition of the company. He remarked that I must be special if my superiors had always kept me nearby since I didn't occupy the same stature that they did. I thanked him as graciously as possible and I must not have been very convincing because his eyes still had that hard aspect to them that when he was giving me looks from across the conference table. The first meeting ended good though they were more one-on-ones, and the questions got more probing, and I became more defensive. And then I started to think I saw changes in the man on the other side of the language barrier. When he blinked for a split second, I would see what resembled a second membrane sweep back and forth across his eyes. Then his eyes had a slight glow to them that was perceptible even in a meeting room where daylight was streaming through the large glass windows. And then his tongue looked different. Several times when he was telling me how happy I would be, the more I embraced the destiny of our two companies. His tongue flicked out differently, not like you's and eyes. It was long and more narrow. Once and only once, I thought I saw it move in a way that didn't seem possible. When you see something like that only once, you think you're losing your mind. I felt cornered in these meetings, and I studied the way the new CEO and his people regarded me. It was like they weren't sure what to do with me, as if they weren't sure that they could get through to everybody but me. Whatever tactics or whatever they were using that worked on everybody else, it wasn't phasing me. Look, I'll be blunt. I'm convinced that this man and his people are reptilians, and they have used hocus pocus or some kind of mind control technique to secure the acquisition of our company and the cooperation of everybody in their way. I have listened to your past stories about similar creatures being found in remote and wild areas, which just adds another chilling dimension to my experience and makes it all the more real for me. It means these things are everywhere, whether they're embodying human beings or whether they're just in their fleshly beast bodies whatever that means. That means they're watching us wherever we are, from the bottom of human society, all the way to the top. So my story isn't necessarily a monster sighting, as it is just a creature that I've never seen before, nor heard of, nor could properly identify. But first, before I get into that, I'm gonna give you just a tidbit of backstory. Don't worry. I'm not going to feed you a novella of backstory. Years ago, maybe about four or five, I think it was about 2015 or 2014, if my memory serves me right, 
I was visiting some friends all over Australia since I had just found the time to vacation down there finally, and it's a trip I had been planning for a long time. These friends of mine took me all over the country, visiting all sorts of amazing sites. We spent a lot of time traveling, and in between that time, we spent a lot of time seeing the wild, even going as far into central Australia as we could. Now, for those that don't know, assuming and hoping you'll read this to your audience, Australia is home to a vast wildlife and environment. Everything from desert to wetlands and everything in between, which means there is a vast array of all different sorts of life that is only found exclusively in the land down under. Another reason why I love the country. Anyway, at some point or another during our travels, I thought I saw what I thought was initially was a crocodile, but this thing didn't quite look like a crocodile, at least the closer we got to it. It was much larger and looked much more grotesque looking, had bizarre features. In fact, it looked more like an alien crossed with a frog, crossed with a crocodile. It was a very strange looking creature. I had even nudged a few of my friends and told them to check it out and they too were very perplexed at the sight. Now, to kind of give you more information, this thing was kind of just sitting there along the side of a large river, and it didn't really make a lot of sense. I knew Australia were already home to weird things, especially like reptiles, snakes, crocodiles, you name it, but I had never quite seen a creature like this before. It resembled that of a crocodile, at least in size, probably spanning 12 to 15 feet I mean, this thing looked like a living dinosaur. But its face wasn't that of a crocodile. It had teeth, and kind of resembled one, but its face and snout were much shorter, and its body, like I said, almost resembled that much more of a frog than it did an alligator or a crocodile. It didn't really have scales as much as it looked to have amphibious skin. Again, it's really hard to describe because of how we saw it but it was very strange, and at the time, none of my close friends knew, or even now, know exactly what it was we saw. They've never seen it, they have never heard anything like it, nor did any of us ever see anything like it again afterwards. We kind of just left it be, and didn't really bring it up again. But sometimes, when we talk, we'll still bring it up, because it was so weird. But I guess when you're in the outback, I mean not just the desert outback, but out in the middle of nowhere, thick in the Australian bush, you'll probably run into all sorts of stuff that you didn't know exist. I mean, hell, I can't even imagine the things Australian indigenous people run into that most of us, civilized society, have no idea still exists. There is so much room and area for things to roam without ever being discovered, especially in a place like Australia where there's so much room for things and creatures to go undiscovered by man. About two years ago, a close friend and I decided to visit the Aztec Falls, which is just outside of LA. I don't know if it's that we went on an off day or what, but there was hardly anybody else around, which usually always makes for a much greater time swimming. Anyway, it went as usual, so there's really no need to fill you in with boring details about us swimming and doing stuff. But as we were leaving, we saw a creature that we can't even identify this was a creature that came right out of our nightmares, something we would have never expected to ever see in our lives. This unusual creature appeared to almost float on the water, coming towards us. It had the face of a dragon almost, with a red covering its entire body, like its body was a deep red, which is one of the reasons it stood out so much. It was terrifying looking, it had little horns sticking out of its body, and small jagged brown little spikes or thorns, if that makes sense. It almost kind of had a deformed, swollen face. My friend and I were partially frozen in fear and curiosity, just to try to make out exactly what it is we were looking at. But the closer this thing got, the more we were actually able to make out that this wasn't anything natural. The closer it got, it began to open its mouth and reveal large, tiny little teeth, full of sharp fangs, 
We got out of there pretty quickly. And luckily, I don't think anybody else was victim or even saw what we did, since we seemed to be in an area where nobody else was around. Back in the summer of 1995, myself and my sister both suffered a very traumatic miscarriage. It was a terrible time, and we both grieved in very different ways. The one way we both coped, though, was to every day, for the entire summer, go down to the beach and watch the sunrise every morning. We both would sit there, watching the sun come up in the sky, and grieve in our own way. We are now both in our late 50s, and feel it might be the right time to come forward about an experience we had during the summer. As we watched the sun come in one morning, my sister persuaded me to go down to the waves and soak my feet in the tide. I did so, thinking it might be nice to feel the sea on my feet at this time in the morning. We stood at the shore for around two or three minutes. My sister pointed out that she could see something black swing past. We didn't know what it could be, but just dismissed it as a trick of the light. Then, a few moments later, she noticed the same thing swim past. I saw it too, and didn't know what it was. It looked like a submarine, but that was a ridiculous notion, as it was only about 5 or 10 feet deep in the water. Then, the next thing, we both fell back onto our backsides and screamed in terror. A reptilian looking creature, the face of a crocodile, and the body that resembled a human was swimming past us with its body diving in and out of the water. It had green scaly skin, very large muscles, and crooked like feet which ended in long webbed paws that had sharp toenails like fangs. It's very weird to describe but that's what it looked like. The creature had a very horrendous face and two huge black holes for eyes, and a large mouth. The creature, whatever this was, thrashed around in the water, as if it was hunting for prey, and glanced once at us, but somehow showed little interest. It continued flopping around the water for about a few minutes. We both just lay there with our mouths open in horror and shock, as the sun illuminated us both in the scene of the horror. When the creature had submerged and left, we both came to our senses and managed to walk back to our cars without losing it. We had talked about the incident since and wondered whether we should tell anybody. I told my husband, but he assured me at the time that it was just a side effect of my meds. I had been on Prozac after the miscarriage. I know what I saw was real to this day. Nobody believes me except my sister since we had both suffered intermittent depression for the last 25 years, and my sister suffers really bad from panic attacks. I think this was the incident that triggered her panic. I can't describe to you the horror of what I saw. It was hideous looking. I've never seen a creature like it, ever. Now, any time I go to the ocean, that's always at the forefront of my mind. A few months after that experience, there was a shark attack on the beach, and a kid had died. Perhaps I witnessed something supernatural, or perhaps this was some kind of unknown creature that marine biologists have yet to discover. I think it would help me and my sister if we knew what we saw was real or not. I know it is. My career as a security guard began and ended at Fort Knox. I know you think that they'd be a little more picky about who they recruit. The place is impregnable by any human means, so the guards just need warm bodies with opposable thumbs that can make phone calls and watch security feeds. Note that I said Fort Knox is impregnable by any human means. I had little experience that shows me that humans are the only creatures interested in material assets. Coming up on the place is pretty much a suicide attempt but that doesn't keep the occasional figure showing up on camera at the very edge of the property. You gotta think, people are just curious, minus all the security measures, more wealth than they've ever seen sitting just a short distance away. 
But since the place is surrounded by steel fences, machine guns, landmines, and guard boxes, nobody really ever gets close. Well, one night, I spotted movement on the usual feed. A large shape was moving around the edge of the fence, as if it were more than just a curious visitor. That guy looks like they might actually be dumb enough to try and break in. I was right. This figure scaled the fence in no time, a feat considering that it is both electrified and is barbed wire at the top. Before I could react, the figure also slinked across the expanse of booby trap turf, triggering nothing. Its steps were carefully placed, and its overall movement was fluid and graceful. It almost looked like it was swimming through the air. I radioed that somebody had breached the perimeter and was rapidly advancing towards the central bunker. You know what? Since nobody believed that this place could be broken into, everyone was asleep at their posts for the night. I was the only one remaining vigilant, and I couldn't do anything except bark over the walkie-talkie. So, I decided to focus on getting a clear image of the intruder, who had bypassed the laser-triggered alarm and began scaling the granite walls. It was when the figure was climbing closer to the sheer granite walls that I realized I was dealing with nothing mundane. Not only was this moving with incredible speed, but a long tail dangled behind it. It looked and moved the way I've seen some species of lizards do, just the way they scale trees, with the very same fluid, liquid movements. For half a second, the thing paused its ascent and looked over its shoulder into the camera. The face was indistinct, but two eyes glowed with mischief, reflecting the night vision back into the lens. I was on the walkie every 30 seconds, and by the time I was finally able to rouse somebody, it seemed too late. The creature, the person, whatever this was, had gotten past the most sophisticated equipment in the country, and upon further investigation, had made it all the way into the vault. This was something obviously akin to lizards. It must have been sentient and intelligent. I tried to resist the connections that were being made in my mind, but logic is logic. If a thief breaks in for the sake of breaking in, it's either a thrill seeker or a test, an audit. A reptilian monster was performing an audit of Fort Knox's security measures. Why would the United States government put such a creature up to a security audit unless the people assigning the audit were reptilians themselves. When you work this closely with the government, you hear all the conspiracy theories that are there to be heard. But that night, I began to buy to them, and I suddenly feel very uncomfortable about who I'm working for. I was taking my family camping we're a small clan, just me, my wife, and my six-year-old son. We're pretty much city slickers, so we don't quite go hardcore on roughing it. We had a tent, and a means of building a fire, but we also kept a camper nearby, just in case the experience got to be too much for any of us to handle. I know, don't laugh at me. I'm surprised and proud to say that we held out better than most my son complained about the bugs for about an hour, but then he was charmed by the entire thing. So, I was obligated to suppress my own complaints about insects and heat and the like. It was the second night, and we were all in our tents. My son had his own tent that was small. It was like a little bubble that was attached to ours. I was awoken by the sound of my son calling my name gently. He sounded a little hoarse, and my parental instincts immediately made me wonder if something was wrong. This sense heightened when I realized that his voice was coming from outside the tent. So, I relaxed a little bit, thinking he needed me to guide him to the outdoor toilet or something. But there was still something about his voice that was off-putting. I unzipped the tent to see what was the matter. His voice came again, but it was far away. I whispered, Son? Then I heard something like his voice asking me to come here. There wasn't any reason not to, but it didn't feel right. 
I replied that he should come here, but this got me no answer. Then a thought occurred to me. It was crazy, but this was his whole experience. I carefully unzipped a flap between my tent and my son's bubble tent while firing at my cell phone screen for a light. There was my son asleep. I heard the same voice again outside the tent. This time, I did not answer. After a while, the fire pit was kindled again, and apparently, whoever was out there had some coals that were still red, and added some wood on or something. That's when I heard an animalistic hissing noise come from the silhouette that I could barely see from the light of the fire. It looked like something bestial, long limbs, and a neck that sloped seamlessly into a skull and shoulders, and I could see it had some sort of tail with pointed features picked out by the glow of the faint fire. This thing hesitated for a moment and then ran away into the trees. It had the shape and movement of almost a dragon, if that makes sense. Like an upright walking Komodo dragon, I should clarify. It was terrifying looking, even though I never got to actually peek out my tent and see this thing for what it was. But again, I'm glad I didn't because I didn't want to but I saw enough of the silhouette that it looked just like a kimono dragon that was walking on two legs that ran away quickly. Needless to say, we cut our camping trip short after that, and I'm sending you my story since I don't think anybody else will believe me, and I know there's only a few that will share my story. I was pregnant with my first child, and hosted a massive baby shower in the backyard of my house. I live in the south, and at the time, it was spring, so the weather was fantastic, and hosting the event outside made it easier as my house wouldn't get trashed. Still, I was absolutely exhausted by the end of the night, and as my husband was gone for a work trip, I didn't have anybody to help me clean up. So, I said screw it, I was too tired and too pregnant to bother. I decided to let the wild animals eat whatever food was left and then clean up the rest in the morning. I know, bad call. I took a shower, brushed my teeth, and then went off to bed. In the middle of the night, I was jolted awake by the sound of a balloon popping in my backyard. My heart began to race, and I peeked out the blinds, skinning the area to see what I could find. After a few moments, I saw something quickly weaving its way through the chairs and tables, knocking over a few in the process. I blinked a couple of times, but I couldn't seem to make out what was out there. It then occurred to me that I'd left the food out, and that must have been what the animal was looking for. I was ready to ignore it and go back to bed, when the sound of a squawk caught my attention once more. I again tried to see what it was, but it was just too dark. I made my way down the stairs, flicked on the back light, and went out the back door, peering into the distance. I gasped as my eyes met that of something that looked straight out of a horror or sci-fi film. It was a person, but with incredibly strange posture. Its skin tied upon its body, yet appeared to be covered in scales. Its eyes reflected from the light, and it had a tail that rested near its feet, in which they more closely resembled a bird's talons. It let out the same squawk sound that I heard a few minutes prior, and I shut and locked the door. It ran up to it, scratching the wood deeply as it tried to get in, banging on the door, nearly breaking the entire door down with its immense weight. I was screaming hysterically, running back up the stairs as fast as I could. I shut and locked the door behind me and even put a chair under the knob for good measure, not knowing what else to do. I knew if this thing broke the door down there, well, a measly chair holding the door back wouldn't do anything. I would be done. I called my husband in absolute hysterics, not taking into consideration that he was probably sleeping. Even though he was out of it, he perked up as soon as he heard how panicked I was, and he believed me. 
he wanted me to check if it was still there. I looked out the window and could still see it moving around, so I confirmed to him that it was. He told me just to stay inside, and I told him I didn't plan on going out. He asked me if I was okay, had it hurt me, and I told him no. He asked me if I should call the police, and I was torn. Word spreads fast in our little town, and I was worried if the monster, whatever this thing was, was gone by the time the cops arrived. I'd hurt our reputation, since we're kind of known in our community. My husband stayed on the phone with me, and I continued to watch this reptile freak of nature move around before it finally let out to seem what be a frustrated noise and leapt away into the thick forest. I waited a few moments, but it didn't seem to come back out. My husband and I talked a bit longer, and I finally had to let him go after what felt like hours of phone conversation keeping him on the line for my own comfort. After that, I just laid in bed and waited and waited, thankful that neither I nor my baby were hurt. I was too scared to go downstairs anytime soon. For unrelated reasons, we moved a few years later. My son was eventually born and was old enough. I actually told him the story, and even though I expressed to him how terrified I was, and how we encountered something that doesn't exist. He just seemed bummed out that he wasn't actually able to see it for himself. Go figure. I've seen some wild things out of my days of hiking out in the backcountry, and I have two really bizarre sightings to share with you. The first one takes place in central Idaho, out in the backcountry. Now, before I go on to the actual encounter, both of these sightings, I appeared to see nearly the same creature. At least, they were nearly identical, which leads me to the speculation that these are from the same species, which means there's not just one of them. I have also had several run-ins with Bigfoot, so I know there are things that go bump in the night, and things we can't explain. To how many of these creatures exist, well, that I have no idea. I was setting up camp, and right across where I was camping at was a rather large creek, which was very convenient for me since I had access to water just right there. But as the evening grew, and I felt like it was near time to turn in, when I heard something really large approaching me from the forest behind me, I turned, and out from the woods stepped this thing. I can only describe it as a thing because I don't know what to even call it. If I were to use actual words to describe it, I would say it was a human-like lizard with a dinosaur as a head. I know that sounds incredibly crazy, but that's exactly what it looked like. It looked like an upright walking lizard, and the head almost resembled that of something you would see in the movie Jurassic Park. It had fierce yellow eyes, and although it never opened its mouth, or showed any teeth. It just looked at me and kind of studied me for a minute and then turned around and casually walked back the way it came as if just running into me and not thinking much more of it. I was shocked and even though it was nighttime or getting near night, I tore down my tent and decided to just hike as much as I could into the night with as little light as possible. I didn't want to camp near whatever that was I had no idea if it was capable, or maybe it was going to come back to case my tent, or me. My second encounter happens out in the backwoods of Mississippi, where I had a nearly identical situation. Now, the first creature had a dark green and light green patterns on its body, with little specks of brown on its face. Again, had you looked at this thing, it looked right out of a video game, or even a movie. Even though in appearance, this one looked very similar to the first one that I saw, this one looked much more evil, and unlike the first one, didn't have as much slender features as it did masculine and muscular. This thing was also darker in color, more almost like a black green, so to speak, and its eyes seemed to give off a much different fierceness to it. I stumbled upon it when I came upon this thing eating a dead doe, in response to my appearance and arrival, it acted hostile immediately, 
and what I believe bluff charged me. Now, I didn't impede on this thing's meal. I was visible from probably about 50 feet away, but it instantly sensed my presence, and I don't know if these things have a territory or markings or what, but it acted out of pure hostility, and this thing was fast. I ran in fear, and even though I come equipped, I didn't plan on shooting something that I don't know what it is, especially considering one, there could be more of them, and two, what if I didn't kill it and only pissed it off more? It's not worth my life. I had enough time to flee, and although it didn't seem to pursue chasing me, it was enough to scare me. Looking back on the situation, I think being scared more came from that I'd never seen a creature like this, and then it acted aggressive, not knowing if it was capable of killing me. And even now, when I ponder back to it, I always think about what if. It could have killed me had I stayed around, especially considering I don't know exactly what it is that I was dealing with. What I saw is something you would expect to see around the swamps, or something out of a movie, but not in the middle of the woods. I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, but sometimes I wonder, do genetic experimentations make it out into the woods by themselves? Since the first time I encountered this in Idaho back a few years ago, it was just casually wandering around, and it happened to run into me. This time though, when I saw the different one in the backwoods of Mississippi, it was casually eating a deer doing its own thing when I stumbled upon the pasture that it was in, and it immediately saw me as a threat. I wonder if there's a reason for that, but more importantly, I want to ask the real questions. What are these things? What is their purpose? And what is their intent? During the late 90s, my parents were going through some pretty tough financial issues to the point where they couldn't even afford to put food in my mouth. I had to be sat down and given a tough talk, where I was informed I'd have to move states away from all my friends, attend a new school, and live with my dad's brother and his wife for an indefinite amount of time. I was 11 when this happened, and it ended up lasting throughout all of my adolescence. I was unsurprisingly not happy, and for a long time did not warm up up to what were essentially my new parents. A few weeks after my move, in an effort to try and bond with me, my uncle said he wanted me to help him do some yard work, and that after it was all done, we could go get some ice cream. I begrudgingly agreed. He told me to get some things out of his shed, and to grab the key in the laundry room, which had a key ring of a grizzly bear. Once I found it, I went out to the shed, unlocked it, opened it up, and went to search for what my uncle wanted me to get. However, I froze in my tracks as my eyes took in the sight before me. Something was curled up in a fetal-like position on the floor, heavily breathing. It looked nearly alien. It was monkey-like in shape, but about the size of a human child, not much smaller than me at the time. It had reptile skin, and its bones stuck out through every part of its body. It was like a bearded dragon almost, except in human form. It clearly had been starving for some time. It had long gangly fingers and claws at the end, and its tail curled around its limbs. Its eyes were closed, but it flicked them open to look at me, and they were yellow, very serpent-like. It opened its mouth slowly and hissed, revealing jagged, sharp teeth. I quickly moved out of fear, grabbed the things, and shut the door behind me, breathing and hyperventilating. I still wasn't entirely trusting towards my uncle, so I decided to just keep my mouth shut and let this be his problem when he came across it. I did the yard work with him, and we went out to go get ice cream, and the reptile thing ended up slipping my mind. It was sunset by the time we returned home, and my uncle asked me to go put everything back where it was in the shed. It was then that I immediately remembered the reptile. I was curious to see if it was still there, so I grabbed the things and opened the door it was still there, 
still laying in the same spot on the floor. It looked up at me again, and I put the objects away. But my curiosity got the best of me, so I grabbed a nearby fishing pole and poked at it. After a few moments, it stood up on two legs and hissed and acted extremely aggressive to where I screamed and ran away, outside. This thing took off after me and then bolted off left into the trees. I didn't bother chasing after it, for obvious reasons. My uncle heard my screams and came out running, asking what was wrong. Not knowing what to say, I just told him I felt a big spider crawl on me. He laughed and then went back inside. After four or so months passed, I finally felt like I'd formed a close enough bond with my aunt and uncle to be able to finally tell them what it is that I saw. They listened and told me they'd keep an eye out for it, even though they'd never seen it before. Anyway, I'm writing this up now because just this morning, my uncle called me up to tell me that after 20 years, he finally saw it. After my brother and I graduated high school, because we had a really crappy upbringing, we ended up roomating together and got this little house. What was wonderful about that house was that it had a detached garage, but it wasn't a detached garage in the typical sense, where you'd have your house, some space, and then the garage. No, it was almost like a detached garage that was built much later on, far back behind the house. I don't think any cars were ever stored in there, nor was there really any pathway or driveway created to go up to that detached garage. When we got into it, it was mainly just a giant room used for storage. So think like a large open room like a garage, but just detached and probably about 200 feet directly behind our house, bordering some thick woods to the left and some fields to the right, followed by more thick woods. Directly behind that, is wetlands and lots of it. Directly to the front of the house was our large yard and then a singular road that if you go for about 15 to 18 minutes will take you right into town. I say 15 to 18 minutes because it just depends on how fast you drive. My brother and I were rarely ever home at the same time considering he worked the night shift and I worked during the day and a lot of the time our schedules would overlap if we weren't working normal shifts. So, meaning that usually one of us was always home, but hardly if ever both at the same time. Well, one time during the day, I got a phone call from my brother, and he was freaking out, screaming at me, telling the damn lizard man was trying to break into the back garage. I kind of laughed at him and told him he was having a nervous breakdown, but he told me exactly what I just told you. I thought he was trying to pull a prank, so I just humored him, and tell him I would check it out when I got home. Well, when I got home that evening, he had to already have left because he had to go to his work. So, I checked out the back garage. Like I said, it was about roughly 200 feet away from the house. Just estimating, of course. I didn't actually measure. I did see large indents in the wet ground, but nothing that I would chalk up to something a lizard man supposedly made. I showed no signs of a break-in at all, checking the door handle, the door, any markings on the siding, nothing. So, whatever I thought, I went back inside, watched TV, and did my thing. I want to say it was about 7.45, maybe 7.50 in the evening, right when I started to hear loud banging and ruckus. I got up, thinking some sort of animal was wandering outside. The noise was coming from back by the garage, and it was loud. It sounded like somebody was trying to break the door down. So I grabbed my flashlight that I keep by the door, run outside, and shine it in the direction. I dropped my flashlight and my mouth at the same time in absolute horror. As soon as I shone my light on the door of the garage, this thing, a flipping lizard man, turned its head to look right at me. This thing was hideous, from head to toe. I mean, a description isn't really needed. If you just jump on the internet and look up Lizard Man, this is about as general as you can get. This Lizard Man was pitch black though. It wasn't green like you'd expect it to be, or 
if there's any color that you would expect a lizard man to be. At least, I think of reptiles, so I think of green. But it was pitch black and had huge, large yellow eyes. It saw me, but I think it just saw the light that I shone at it, because it instantly dropped down on all fours and sprinted off back into behind the garage where the wetlands are. I heard it trotting off, and it sounded incredibly heavy. I ran back inside immediately, called my brother's cell phone, which surprisingly he picked up. He usually doesn't when he's at work. I flipped out on him, told him I saw what he was talking about, and then I apologized for ever doubting him. We came to the conclusion that we need to do something, but what? Just like in the movies, calling the police isn't going to do anything. They're not going to believe you, they think you're going to be pulling a prank, and of course, anything they find or don't find will always result in inconclusive, and they'll give you the same old answer. We'll look into it. Yeah, right. So, we decided to take matters into our own hands by setting up traps all around our garage. We had a couple bear traps lying around, but also smaller traps. We set those up, and then I waited, waited. The next couple nights, nothing happened. And then finally, one morning I got up, which probably would have been about three or four nights since I saw what I did, and every trap that we had placed, which was probably about five, were completely gone. Nowhere to be found, no signs of them being picked up or taken or dragged away. Just gone. That freaked us out. So, my brother and I decided to stay at a friend's house for a couple weeks, just until we can get our heads level and figure out what it is we were wanting to do. Our good friend of ours let us borrow some of his guns. He had a shotgun and a magnum and a couple of other high-powered, high-caliber weapons. I'm not talking anything like a 50 caliber rifle or anything, but a little bit more punch than just a typical 9mm Beretta. So, we ended up going back to the house and having our weapons ready, just in case this thing tried to break into our house and get to us. Well, nothing really happened for the next few weeks afterwards, and that few weeks turned into a couple of months. After a while, it had been nearly three months since we saw or heard any activity, and then we got a call from our landlord. He was giving us 30 days to move out. Apparently, he was going to put the house on the market and sell it, because he was in a financial bind. His wife had passed recently, and he desperately needed the money. I guess he was going to ditch the state and head somewhere way south. So, long story short, my brother and I had to find a different place to go. My brother actually found an apartment complex, probably maybe 10 miles away from there, where I moved out of town completely. Anyway, fast forward to today. That was nearly 20 years ago, back in 2002, and we still talk about it from time to time. We always wonder, what was it? What could it have been? It's easy to sit there and say you don't believe monsters exist until you truly are put in a situation where you have to deal with one.